Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to Pretty Gritty Tours. This is yet another virtual tour throughout the great state of Washington. I'm your host tonight, Chris, well, your guide, really. And tonight we are covering haunted bars throughout the state of Washington. And let me just lay the groundwork right out the gate by telling you that there are so many haunted bars throughout the state of Washington. And yes, as some of you have already pointed out, if it's a good bar, it's already full of spirits. That said, there's only so much time that we can actually cover stuff. So we are beginning tonight with my favorites. I'm going to cover my favorite haunted bars throughout the state of Washington, and then we will leave time in the future for other bars. And if you have recommendations or suggestions, please let me know. I try to be very, very responsive to everyone. For example, it's good to see you guys tonight. So if you're watching now, this is a live tour. I'm going to be doing my best to answer comments and questions as we go along. But if you are ready and excited, I say we dive right on in. Because tonight, we've got a lineup of some very exciting places. And I think the absolute best one to start with is, of course, Kells. If you are somehow not familiar with Kells Irish Restaurant and Pub, in um, Post Alley of Pike Place Market. It is right downtown Seattle. It is an iconic landmark. It is important to all drinkers throughout the state of Washington, I think. I feel confident in saying that. But this building has its humble beginnings as the Butterworth Building. And the Butterworth dynasty, I guess, went through several different businesses before they eventually settled on what was going to be, dare I say, their bread and butter worth, the mortuary services. And this building was designed to be a luxury palace of death, not just a, a mortuary for preparation of those who had died. It was also a reception hall so that you could actually hold your funerals in there. It was a morgue. It did transportation. It did the whole service, essentially, from death to beyond. And it is also home to Washington State's very first elevator, which, if I'm not mistaken, at the time was a hydraulic elevator that used water. And there are very few of these water hydraulic elevators still around. I think there's only two left in the state of Washington. I digress. What's extraordinary about this building, this is on the, the uphill portion, so not on the back alley where you enter Kells. This is the original business front that you would have entered. And to give you a glimpse, this is what it would have looked like in the early 1900s when the Butterworth family opened this as a full-service funeral experience, really. And it was, again, comprehensive. They would do everything from uh, body retrieval to coffin sales, and you could rest assured that as soon as your dearly departed were in the hand of the Butterworths, it would be a peaceful experience, but perhaps not so all the way through. The building itself is quite large, and when it was originally drafted, they designed a significant amount of basement area to be utilized for this, this morgue, this mortuary service down there. And while people were always dealing with the retail level up top, it ends up becoming that bottom portion that's really famous for us because today it is Kell's Irish Bar. And it has such extraordinary ghost stories that are attached to it. I've got some personal ones, but just to get you briefly introduced and to show you just how famous this place is before we digress into perhaps some of the more obscure haunted bars in the state of Washington, we'll give you the obligatory news clip. Here you go. Spooky footsteps, fading faces, and a sketchy history of dealing with the dead all attracted some of TV's most famous ghost hunters to Seattle. Come with us, Lisa Jaffe was there as the eerie evidence was uncovered. Belly up to the bar at Kells. And over the years, you know, you hear the stories. And you'll likely hear whispers that Irish whiskey isn't the only spirit circulating inside this post alley pub. There was a ghost that was on start. Lights fly, door slam behind it. It's the little girl, and she lives here. Too many sober sightings. I said, oh my God, I just saw a ghost. For Kel's owners to ignore. I saw the little girl. 
And I says, and he says, I have never been afraid in all my life. Karen McAleese recalls a recent scare involving a security worker in the stairwell. He saw her feet on the stairwell. So he radioed to the front and he said, um, I have a minor in here, I have a child. A little girl with ringlets and red velvet, reportedly seen on several occasions. Well, he saw her feet on the way coming up. And so he ran up here after her and he could hear the pitter patter. All of a sudden he realized, wait a minute, this is, was a spirit I saw, not, this was not a person. More evidence of spirits upstairs. A construction worker snapped a photo of the old Butterworth building's studs. I, at first, when I looked at the picture, I didn't know what I was looking at. I'm like, maybe. Well, we'll look between the door jam and when we zero, zoomed in on it, I'm like, wow. And it takes a lot to shake up the typically skeptical Patrick McAleese. Like, Woo, that's, that, that even threw me for one. I've never seen grown men run out of door in my life like that at three in the afternoon. That blurry image captured the attention of TV's Ghost Adventures crew. <laughs> it is a creepy it's photo. It's a creepy photo. <laughs> well, you're in the your Butterworth building. It was the building's history intrigued the popular paranormal investigators. And before we look for the ghosts, we try and dig up the history. And this place was the site of a very corrupt mortuary. If you go through this here, Long before the serving street. Guinness and stew. So this is where they would bring the coffins up. This spot served as Seattle's first full service mortuary, complete with crematorium and morgue. This was the old chapel. Run by undertaker E.R. Butterworth and Sons, accused of collecting corpses for cash. Do the dead hold a grudge? Come and show yourself to us. That's what these ghost hunters want to know. Uh, right now we're doing something called a group EVP session. What EVP is electronic voice phenomena or spirit voices that are captured on a digital recorder. They begin at the neighboring market theater, recording their provoking questions. When played back, they hear eerie answers. I don't like you. Wow. I don't like you. Rewind it. Oh, that is creepy. <laughs> Above the Irish pub, the paranormal search stirs up more unexplained audio. Did they say hey there? Where's hey there. Hey there. Hey there. Hey there. The investigations offer some comfort to Karen McAleese. I think they all thought I was nuts until, until the ghost doctors came around and then they thought, oh, there's more nuts than us. <laughs> but did they make a believer out of her brother? It's like if I had to make the choice, you know, believe yes or no, it's like not too much stuff just unexplained. Cal's owners tell me they're not really worried about what ghost hunters find inside these old haunts. Their mom always said there's more reason to fear the living than the dead. In Seattle, Alisa Jaffe, Como 4 News. A lot of good wisdom throughout there. And yeah, honestly, if I were a spirit haunting a place and the Ghost Hunters group came in and started yelling at me, I wouldn't like them much either. Now, when you're dissecting the history of the Butterworth Building, I think there's a couple things I want to address just to the veracity of the ghost claims here. And the Butterworths weren't accused of collecting bodies for money. That's something that we have documented. During the early days of Seattle, the city would actually pay mortuary services to go, and if people that didn't have families to claim them were dead in the street or had been accosted, something like that, they would pay them to actually pick them up, clean them up, and then see to their remains. The controversy with the Butterworth family actually, to my knowledge, comes with Dr. Linda Hazard, which if you don't know her story, I'm only going to give it to you in brief today, but she is the owner, the former owner of a sanitarium where she treated it as an exotic health spa for people and then essentially starved them to death robbed them and got them to sign over power, power of attorney to her as they became more and more no longer in possession of their faculties. And she ends up going through a huge amount of legal troubles for this whole thing and actually meets her demise when she prescribes her own treatment to herself and then starves to death. Now the Hazard family gets in contact with the Butterworth family because they actually end up being responsible for some of the remains of people that die 
on the hazard facility. And there is a legal claim that at one point the Butterworth family cremated the remains of someone who had been murdered at the hands of Dr. Linda Hazard and then presented a different body that hadn't been emaciated when people asked to see what had happened to them. So there is a tremendous amount to suggest that there would be some unrest inside the Kells building. I can tell you that the one that I've had the most experience with is of the kid. People keep saying that they see like a little girl wandering around there. And the times that I've been there, there's definitely been something that I've seen out of the corner of my eye that looks like a little girl. And I want to just give you some of the footage that I have of Kells. Also for this, we're just gonna have to address this really quick. For those of you who have missed uh, Aries the cat, don't worry, uh, he is he's around. He just has much higher rates. Now that our audience has grown over the last year and a half of pandemic, uh, people are you know really demanding a lot of him and he requires something significantly more to compensate him than we're able to afford. So if you have missed the, the white cat, lurking around in the back of these virtual tours. Don't worry, he's around. He's just, uh, frankly, too expensive for me these days. So that's Kells. Kells, I, I can't recommend enough. There's so much going on in the building. And the, the photo that always comes back to me is this one that they got of someone peeking back through the studs of the building when they were renovating it. And I wish I could find a higher resolution one of it. I have not been able to find it online. But uh, the first time I saw it, it just shook me to the core, seeing this face. And in the high def photo, you can actually see it looks like the person's mouth has been sewed shut, which was a common practice at the time for the Butterworth family, uh, for the deceased, that they would make sure that the, the mouth wouldn't come open later on. You may have also seen this photo circulating around of the little girl or of a disfigured child wandering around the building. And that's gonna become important later for us at our next Seattle bar. But I wanna take a quick trip north, if you will, to join me for what I think is probably the second most famous haunted bar in the state of Washington, the Oxford Saloon. If you have not been up to Snohomish to check out the Oxford, please add it to your list, make a day trip of it. This was originally built in 1900 and first served as Blackman's Dry Goods, then almost immediately became a saloon. And while it has changed hands over the years, it has remained predominantly a saloon. Although uh, a little something something going on upstairs, as with all good saloons. Now you may notice here as the Oxford, it was established in 1910, but the building itself draws its history from the 1900, or 1900 exactly. And it's, it's the story of Kathleen that haunts people here. There are a few ghosts that linger inside the building, but Kathleen was the woman who ran an upscale brothel upstairs of the Oxford Saloon. And while she was in the clawfoot tub in her own personal suite that she had up there, a mysterious stranger broke in and murdered her while she was in the tub. And people continuously see what they think is Kathleen coming in and out of the building or up and down the stairs. And Evening Magazine did a great little thing on it. And I wanted to share a brief moment of that with you guys. 
The Oxford was built in 1890. On the outside, it looks just like, you know, a divey saloon. We have a lot of history here. So this was our bar back in the 1920s. There is a moose there, and we have the same moose right up here. This one right here is one of the original Oxford saloon signs. It's just one of the many signs. There's one, two, three, four old signs here. Those are the real old signs from throughout the years. The mannequin up top, that's, uh, that's actually Kathleen. She was the, uh, the lady who ran the brothel upstairs in the 1800s, and she was decapitated in the bathtub that we still have. Kathleen was in here taking a bath, and a gentleman came in here, killed her in this exact bathtub. Uh, I'm gonna get out of here. If you have heard about our haunted history, you'll hear about Henry the Ghost. Henry was killed on the bottom stairs. He is one of the men with the mustache. They say it's one of the most haunted buildings in Washington. So I have to ask, with all these ghost activities, have any bottle gone missing? <laughs> no. Certainly not for paranormal reasons, but maybe once or twice. For me, with my experience at the Oxford, it is the downstairs bar that is the weirdest and like, has the creepiest vibe to it. Uh, not just because of my propensity for day drinking, but sometimes when you go there, there is just something distinctly off about it and it's hard to put your finger on it. But I have been down there multiple times with friends and we've heard someone, it just sounds like they're running down the stairs to get to the bar, never anybody there. Now, my experience with the upstairs is significantly more limited, but I've had people who have lived in the Snohomish area who've said that they'll go to lunch there sometimes and they'll just see a woman, like peek around the edge and look down to see what's going on down there. Or uh, we had one woman say that she just saw a face uh, like appear out of the wall one time, stare at her and then slide back in. As far as I'm concerned, uh, whatever whatever your take is on the paranormal activity there the the moose head above the bar just by itself is creepy enough but also if you've been to the oxford then you've seen this beauty right here this doll has done the rounds through snohomish i forget exactly when she arrived in the oxford but was in possession of the building owner for a period of time and then Every time someone tried to buy the doll, it always ended up getting returned because people were having horrifying experiences with this thing, that it would move around, that it would show up where it shouldn't, that it would like have things on its lap and they'd wake up in the middle of the night and there would be like items uh, like silverware or whatever in its lap uh, that they hadn't put there. Eventually, the doll continuously gets returned to the Oxford, where it now is in a prominent location so that she doesn't get angry for being neglected, but is in a nice tight case so she doesn't run around in the middle of the day. And honestly, there's just few things creepier than a doll, if, if I can be perfectly honest with you. Now, if we're going to talk about old bars with sordid history, I would be completely off base if I didn't bring up Seattle's oldest continuously operating restaurant, Merchant's Cafe. Constructed first in 1890 uh, by, get this, W.E. Boone, who is the direct line descendant of Daniel Boone. It is often billed, it's got the little historic plaque as the oldest operating restaurant on its original location in Seattle. Frankly, it always gets really complicated when you say the oldest of anything, because then you have to be like, well, is it the oldest continuously operating? Is it the oldest under the same name? Is it, I'm going to do away with that, save you guys the, the trouble and just let you know that this is historic. It is very old and it's very much haunted. And merchants, I'll, I'll give you a quick look inside here. Welcome to the Merchant's Cafe and Saloon, Seattle's oldest restaurant, established in 1889. A lot of history here, uh, from, you know, from being Shanghai to uh, a brothel being upstairs to the place being haunted, believe it or not. Now it's the underground portion of Merchant's that freaks me out the most. 
they have a secondary bar downstairs and you can see the vaulted section because you're right underneath the sidewalk there. And in fact, when you're outside merchants, you can see the glass tiles that look down. And the space has a terrifying feeling to it. And each of these little underground sections is just barred up because it extends deeper into the city beyond just this location here. Of the things that I know that have happened at Merchants, the people that have worked there have said that, you know, they'll lock up those cages at night, trying to lock up the booze, essentially, to make sure that people don't come from the other underground portion into their space and rob them of the liquor, but that things will be missing. Never booze, but just like things will be thrown off the counter. Things will get pushed over and all of the the gates remain locked. Another thing that people continuously see in merchants is a woman who uh, is in very like conservative dress for the late 1800s and always seems very judgmental. And again, I don't know what it is about women's restrooms for the spirit world, but absolutely one of the most frequented spots where women will be using the restroom by their own account and the stall door will just swing open, but nobody else will be in there with them. It wasn't unlocked. It will just slide open and then swing wide. Or they'll be going to wash their hands and see someone standing behind them in the mirror, but nobody's there. Now we do know that at one point in merchant's history, the gentleman who purchased this Yukon gold miner haven of sin and depravity, uh, his wife was a huge proponent against burning the place to the ground any chance she got and hated it, hated it so much, specifically because of the fact that it was a brothel on the upper portion there. And that, for me, is where the story really got interesting, because you look back through Merchant's history, uh, and it was it was affected by the fire. Originally, in that location, there was a two-story wooden building built by this guy named John Sanderson, who was an early Seattle business guy. And then in the 1889 Great Seattle Fire, this area gets just devastated right off of Pioneer Square, and several children actually die in this space in the fire. Then they rebuild and they rebuild it 1890 as merchants, the brick building, hoping that it will remain, you know, fireproof for as long as possible. And uh, this is it through its history here, but on the wall, I should have put a nudity warning on this tour. I guess you guys should have just assumed. But there are these historic photographs, these pictures, these paintings on the wall. And a lot of them, specifically this one, are, are part of that building's early history. And the understanding was that these were sort of like a menu, that you would go to the back of merchants, kind of look at what interested you, and then that was what you would... Uh, go upstairs to encounter. You could pick a seamstress, let's say, to fix your hem, if we're going to use the, the talk of the time. Now, of the three sort of entities that are seen in merchants most frequently, it is a group of women who are incredibly angry. One woman who always comes with a feeling of intense heat and judgment, uh, almost like there's a fire down there, or the one that is the absolute creepiest is that all the time people say uh, that they'll see something and they're never sure. Like people are like, is it a small dog that got loose, but they'll just see something skitter across the ground. Um, and that they describe it as being small, you know, and looking like it's crawling quickly across the floor, but that it always has sort of a like dark black indistinguishable feature about it. And a lot of the, the energy psychics and the mediums that have been brought into merchants over the years have seen the same thing of what they describe as children, charred children that move around in that underground portion and that people will just catch it out of the corner of their eye moving around in that underground portion down there. So, you know, something to lull you to sleep at night. Now, merchants, again, is not just 
a fantastic haunted location in downtown Seattle, but is absolutely a place that I recommend that you go to try. Because again, as the oldest, as an extremely old restaurant in Seattle and a fantastic bar with, if I say, a stiff pour, it is a wonderful place to visit. And I can't recommend it enough. Whew, here we go. All right. So let's, uh, I'm just checking the comments here. Make sure that I'm not missing anything super important. Okay. So we are about to now embark to one of my favorite haunted bars in all of Washington state. I encountered this place, I don't know, like three or four years ago on my first trip down to a place called Bucota. And if you don't know Bucota, well, let me give it to you in brief, because as those of you who know me know, it is, I think, one of the creepiest, most haunted small towns in all of Washington state. Just outside of the town of Tenino, sort of out in the sticks away from Olympia, is a small, small town. It has a long history of hauntings, ghosts, monsters in the woods. And it also was the site of the first territorial penitentiary in Washington. And I think something like 1,200 people died in that penitentiary. And now that mass grave is just outside of the town of New It has a continuous history of being haunted by dolls of uh, people getting killed by the train in the area. And they have an original gymnasium from the 1930s where people just drop dead on the floor all the time. And eventually they just made the decision, hey, we should open this as a haunted house. So in fact, for those of you who are now intrigued by the town of Bucota, you can actually go down every October, they rebrand by proclamation from the mayor to Bucota. And they are gonna be operating their haunted house in that legit haunted gymnasium down there. And it's uh, it's worth checking out. In fact, I'm pretty sure if you tell them Pretty Gritty Tours sent you, they'll give you a discount on that. But Joe's Place is what I'm interested in. Joe's Place was, as far as I know, the first drinking establishment opened in Bucota when it was a million dollar lumber town. And it opened in 1898 by Joe Farrington. And it has always been a beer tavern, mostly focused on Olympia beer, actually. But it uh, it has seen it's seen its ups and downs over the time that it's been around. When it was first opened by Joe Farrington here. It was just a beer place downtown for the lumberjack workers. And then eventually it was hit by a fire and most of the structure burned down, but the bar was untouched. So they rebuilt and over time, the family has always been involved with Joe's place, but it has changed manager hands again and again. And today it's just down here and people constantly have weird interactions here. Things will fly off the wall. Chairs will get moved around in the middle of the night. And of, of the things that I think is particularly strange, the ghost that occupies this building often cleans up afterwards. They have a compulsive need to make sure that Joe's place is tidy by the end of the night. And I've been down leading ghost tours in Bucota a few times and just seen stuff move inside. Um, TVs will turn on, uh, lights will turn on or off, and you'll just see chairs just slightly move inside the building down there. We actually talked to the bartender about this to see what her take was on everything. And she believes that it is the woman that was the manager of Joe's place. So after Joe ends up passing, he he turns everything over and it goes to uh, a woman named Kristen. Um, before Kristen, though, it was this woman right here, Judy. And 
Judy was, oh, she was militant about the way that Joe's place was run by the, everyone's account. And, and the woman who was bartending the night that I was down there asking questions said that if she doesn't clean up just the right way, stuff happens. She said that the absolute strangest thing that's ever happened to her while she was bartending down there, she was cleaning up for the night. She had uh, some knives because they're a burger joint too. So she had everything laid out on the counter and there's a magnetic rack on the wall where you're supposed to put the knives up and she was going to leave them on the counter. She was like, you know what? It's late night. Uh, I can wrap this all up later. The knives are washed. We can put them up on the magnets later. Uh, let me just go get some other stuff done and maybe go home for the night. So she picks up the sack of trash. She's going to go out the back door to put it in the dumpster. And she said that one of the knives flew across the room and hit the wall right next to her. And she just felt this like intense cold, like there was someone standing directly behind her. And she put the trash down. She went back. She put all the knives up on the wall. And she's like, okay, guess we're done here. But this woman in the photograph here, people have said that they will see her just standing around watching their behavior. Um, the other thing that I think is super strange is that people have talked regularly about seeing someone on fire. And I haven't been able to trace what this is connected to. I know that Joe's place obviously was burned down and the bar was left untouched, but I don't know that anyone was ever lost in that blaze. But multiple people that I've talked to have said that, you know, they'll be going out for the night. They'll go to the bathroom, which is at the back of the place, and they'll just see what looks like a fire sort of in the back court back there. And when they go, they they see just a person standing there on fire. Unaffected by the blaze and just staring at them and that they can feel the heat from the hot fire when they're out there. Now for my money, like I said, I, I try and find the origin to all of the ghost stories that go around here and I have yet to find it. So if anybody knows, if anyone was actually killed in the fire down at Joe's place, please let me know. Cause I would love to tell that story. Joe's place, if you get the opportunity to go check it out, please do. One of my favorite features is this. Behind the bar is an old trap door that was actually used for refrigeration. It was a much cooler section underground. So before they had any sort of refrigeration system in the bar, they dug this hole, this space underneath the bar, and they would keep things down there, particularly beer. And then they could serve it at a considerably colder temperature than people in the area. And that was a big selling point to Joe's. But when you're in there, you'll you'll definitely feel it. There's something very strange about it. And the whole town of Bukota has weirdness attached to it. There are at least one I know of more, in my experience, haunted dolls throughout the city. And while you're walking around, you'll just see them. There will be piles of dolls throughout the city of Bukota. Go check it out. For those of you into the paranormal, you will not regret it. For those of you who hate dolls and ghosts, you will absolutely regret it, perhaps for the rest of your life. Let's take a little trip east, back to my hometown of Spokane. East side of the state originally for me, my friends, and Spokane, Washington has so much incredible history to it. No shortage of haunted bars, but I think the most famous and certainly the one that we should talk about tonight is, of course, the Davenport Hotel. The Davenport, for those of you not familiar with it, was uh, designed and built in 1914 as a massive luxury hotel. It is still a massive luxury hotel, very nice, deeply haunted, and has had so many significant periods of weirdness to it. And uh, Mr. Davenport, the owner of the Davenport Hotel, designed this to be just the bougiest, fanciest, nicest place that you possibly could, and it has withstood the test of time. But throughout the years, it has had no insignificant amount of organized crime, um, Spokane Mafia, which is an actual thing, activity in there, and murders and deaths in and around the building. And I think the most weird and mysterious part of the whole place actually is 
the the underground part of this. So the bar inside the Davenport is the Peacock Lounge. If you've never been inside it, it's clear to know why it's called that. It has a grand uh, stained glass skylight above the bar of a peacock. So super easy there. But beneath the Davenport is actually a network of tunnels. And I know people talk all the time about tunnels underneath stuff, but this one is legit. There's a whole underground Spokane culture, which should be its own tour, quite frankly. But for tonight, I just want to share a little bit of the, the tunnels underneath the Davenport. And you can actually find this. It's an Inlander article that does a really good expose on the tunnels underneath the Davenport, which were originally constructed for water pipe uh, maintenance and steam pipe maintenance. And this is the, the chief engineer of the Davenport building, Max Barron, who at least was at the time crawling through this tunnel network for an expose on it. And there's just terrifying things that happen down there. People continuously will hear uh, footprints or they'll see wet footprints throughout the hotel. And the tunnel system is just a catacomb of nightmares down there, honestly. And it is all connected to original subterranean Davenport, including this. This is the original safe from Lewis Davenport's office. It's in the original location that it was. It is now, I think, essentially underneath the valet parking garage for the Davenport basically two floors down from the main hotel and the the lobby and the hauntings all focus on this same area and for me having stayed in the davenport a few times it usually manifests itself as some sort of electrical thing in fact just the last time i was there everywhere that i went throughout the building there would be a flickering light bulb which i was like no big deal like I mean, actually, it is kind of a big deal. It's a very expensive hotel. For there to just be a light bulb kind of on the fritz is is not normal. They have a whole staff of people that look after that. But what made it super weird is that wherever we went through the hotel, there would be that continuous flickering. <laughs> Okay, my buddy there, this is a true ghost story uh, about me at the Davenport Hotel. When I was in my youth exploring Spokane, which again, I always encourage you guys to do, cool town, there was a moment where I was in the Davenport. I had gone to the Peacock Lounge and I was just like out in Spokane, carousing, having a good time. And I had to use the restroom, but the one right around the corner was full, which I was like, that is so weird. Men's restrooms are never completely occupied. So I go way down the hallway to where the other one was, and the lights were out inside. And like, if you've ever been to the Davenport restrooms, it's not like there's obvious light switches. They they kind of hide them, and they've got little um, like timer sensors on them. So I'm feeling around for it, and I, in sort of the like dim light of the open door, I'm holding the door open down there, I see just one of the stall doors open. And there was a guy standing inside the stall, slowly opening the door, and he had what looked like a mask or a hood or something over his head. And I was like, oh, hell no, I am not dying in the Davenport today. Uh, so I, I went back out and I was like, not interested in that noise. Someone's in the bathroom. And then at that same time, a guy walks past. And he was like, <laughs> you're just looking at me like I was super weird. He opens the bathroom door. All of the lights are on. He goes into the bathroom. and No problem. So now that all the lights are on, I'm like, what the hell is happening? So I open the door. Nothing. 
lights are on, like soft Davenport music is playing, nothing. This guy who just got in and me are the only two people in there. And I would have gone and used the urinal, but I'd already peed my pants. So the only thing left to do was go home that night. And to this day, I think about how weird it was to have just, just walked in there and seen that. All of those downtown buildings have sort of a dark energy on them, but for whatever reason, the Davenport, the ghosts there, man. Uh, one of my dear friends worked for the Davenport Hotel for a long time, and she had stories about just the craziest things that would happen inside that building, where kids would just start crying in the rooms, or that people would get into the room, they'd check in, they'd sit down on the bed, and then feel it drop down as if someone sat down next to them or have the covers pull back while they're just sitting there, you know, over their shoulder, they can see it moving. Great hotel. Absolutely love it. Uh, just be careful when you use a men's restroom, which frankly, that's just good life advice. If I can give you nothing else. Uh, if you're more interested in the underground network of Spokane, that will be a virtual tour coming up here. But again, the Inlander article, this is of uh, Spokane's Irish bar or Doherty's. And um, there's just so much stuff. There is this treasure, which if you've never seen it, is the uh, the Schlange, Schlange, I've never been able to pronounce it correctly, Reservoir, which is underneath a park. When you go and look, it's just a grassy field, but underneath a short flight of stairs is this uh, two and a half acre reservoir of drinking water that provides the the city of Spokane fresh water throughout the year. And they have to send down specialists to check the water on occasion to make sure that it's safe and ready to be distributed. And you would never know that it's down there. And that is the beauty of Spokane, quite frankly, is that there's so much hidden down there. So let's, um, let's, Let's let's take a second here. I want to address some things. Yes, uh, Leavenworth is actually going to be one of my next ones. Leavenworth was another one of the towns that I grew up in in my youth. It's the home of my first ever tour company at the tender age of nine and has some incredible history to it that we are going to be getting into a little bit later. For now, let's go to my current hometown of Tacoma. For those of you based here, I always encourage you guys to go to McConey's. The same way that Merchants has that sort of nebulous title of is it the oldest or is it not, McConey's I list as the second oldest bar in the city of Tacoma. Technically, the SPAR, I give the title because they've been around, whatever. The important part is McConey's and the SPAR are both very old. They've both been around for a very long time. And McConey's had a brothel on the second floor, as did every good drinking establishment at the time. And the basement of this building is what really intrigues me. Uh, you can see the building that used to be next door to it here. To give you some historic context, here's an early postcard for the city of Tacoma with our old city hall building on the right there. The uh, Northern Pacific Railroad headquarters on the left, and then the Bradley Bodega McConey's section right there in the center. But if you're from the Tacoma area, you might be familiar with Neverland Park that used to be out in Point Defiance. It was sort of a mother goose nursery rhymed themed haunt of horrors or childhood delight, depending on when you encountered it out in Point Defiance. But there were uh, other statues that were affiliated with the enterprise that were kept underground beneath McConey's. And here's a snapshot of them down there. So like Hansel and Gretel, the three little pigs, all of this. And there's a ghost story of this young girl who was brutally murdered in downtown Tacoma, just outside of the bodega, uh, kind of where McConey's is today. And that she continuously shows up in that area and moves things around as if she's trying to communicate a message to people down there. And people that have worked at McConey's have told me that they'll go down to the basement of this building to get, you know, supplies, napkins, uh, silverware, whatever. And that all of these statues that were down there will be rearranged. Uh, they'll be made to look like they were playing together. And it's not like it's not like this happens over a period of a month or something. Like, you know, they go down and 
the first part of their shift to get something, they go back down like an hour later and things have been rearranged down there. And McConey's is, is not only just one of the oldest parts, but it is connected to the underground tunnels of Tacoma that extend through all of the major businesses in that downtown core. And the stuff that kind of drifts around down there is deeply, deeply spooky. But people continuously see that little girl around in the area there, whether driving through Point Defiance on Five Mile Drive or just downtown Tacoma, they'll see her just standing in the back alley behind McConey's. So the next time that you go out drinking there, bear that in mind because she's often seen in the building and around it. Uh, and again, huh, that basement, that basement is just a fabric of nightmares. Absolutely. <laughs> So let's 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 branch out now to one of the coolest historic towns in Washington state uh, and certainly one that I am very excited to talk to you about. Now, this clip that I'm about to show you is not from the school in Wilkeson, Washington, but it is very similar to the stuff that's happened there. So I'm going to share it with you guys really quick because I want you to get an idea for the stuff that's been happening inside the elementary school in Wilkeson, Washington. So again, this is not Wilkeson, Washington. That is from Deer Park. Uh, you can look that up. It's a whole great thing. But I wanted to share it with you tonight because, A, it's an awesome piece of, piece of footage of what's going on in that school. But also, the, the downtown corridor of Wilkeson has been having similar situations, but they aren't willing to share their uh, security footage with me yet. There's a caveat to that. So this is... This is Wilkeson, Washington. It is an old, it's not a company town. It was influential with the railroad and coal mining operations. They had a coal coking plant out there, which is very cool that you can still see uh, a large part of those coking ovens down there. But it was essentially established in the 1870s and was important for the Northern Pacific Railroad because of their development of coked coal down there. It is a wild, creepy, fantastic town. So many things have happened down there, including the spontaneous and unexplained decapitation of the mayor by a guy who just picked up an ax, did it, and had no recollection that he did it. But for us, it is the pick and shovel. The pick and shovel bar in Wilkeson, Washington is, without a doubt, one of my favorite places to drink and one of the most haunted places down there. And the echo of that activity ripples up and down the main street of Wilkeson, all the way through uh, the old historic structures, down through, uh, if you haven't been to Simple Goodness, Simple Goodness Soda Shop is such an awesome place. Used to look like this. Um, it was a place called Skeeks. 
uh, run by a guy named Skeek. It has been turned into a cool bar, soda shop, restaurant. And inside, they continuously have uh, things move around. Things fall off the shelf. Things get smashed, get broken in the middle of the night. And they've seen it on their security cameras where in the middle of the night, stuff will just fly off the wall, will slide across the floor. And they eventually put a picture of Skeek up there, as well as they always pour a shot of vodka for him. And since that time, they've seen a tremendous decrease in the paranormal activity in their place, but not so for the rest of the, the lane down there. And in fact, they're right next door to one of the oldest bars in the state of Washington, though no longer in operation. This building here on the left is the Washington Hotel. And this was constructed in the 1870s to accommodate people coming into Wilkeson. And it's still there today, still an original structure. And you can kind of see in this picture here how it slopes down. You can see the sidewalk here and it slopes down to that entryway there. And that's because over time they've elevated the road so many times that the original street level is actually like a foot lower than where it is today. It has all of the original accoutrement inside, including the original bar and all of the rooms and furnishings from when it was operated as a brothel from the late 1800s into the early 1900s. And when it got purchased after being a brothel bar hotel, it got owned for a brief period of time by a woman who uh, owned a significant amount of dolls. And so now in this abandoned bar hotel, there are dismembered doll pieces, mannequins, just all sorts of weird stuff, and they all move around. Uh, this is a completely abandoned building. I know that there are people in Wilkeson who are looking to revitalize this, turn it back into a functional bar. But for now, it is just filled with the, the cast off pieces of nightmares of people who have come before. And they, they sort of dance around in the middle of the night. Now, this is one of the places that I'm hoping to get some of the security footage because uh, the guy who is the steward, the custodian for this building, will get alerts in the middle of the night uh, of people moving around inside this abandoned building. And he shows up immediately. He lives like half, half a block down. Nothing. Never anything inside. But when he looks at the security footage, it will track. You know how some of them track? Like if there's a, a body moving around, can't see anything on the camera, but it will always have the little square as if it's tracking someone across the floor down there. This area kind of, like I said, reverberates down. The school is just a little ways down the street and it continuously has activity inside of it, as does the pick and shovel bar. And that, um, there's just just no end to the activity inside that building. Everything that goes on in the pick and shovel as the sun eventually goes down is weird. And I think of all the bars that have sort of paranormal activity of people seeing stuff skittering around or people inside mirrors or whatever. The pick and shovel is the one where, <laughs> if I may, the spirits have the biggest effect on people in the bar. You read that however you want. But people continuously report just being filled with something, like something that takes over their facilities, their faculties, and they, they are compelled to say or do things that they normally wouldn't. And a lot of people attribute that to the early sort of violent pioneers in the Wilkeson area. I know I'm selling it right now, uh, but absolutely go check it out. It is, like I said, one of my absolute favorite places to drink, and it has such a cool vibe downtown there. And hopefully soon we actually are going to be doing a full tour just committed to Wilkeson. But I wanted to, dare I say, wet your whistle on what's going on down there. Which brings me to another small town, Roslyn, Washington. You've probably heard me talk about the Brick before. The Brick Saloon is constantly uh, talking about itself being the oldest saloon in the state of Washington. We've gone over this, my friends. There are there are old and there are older. It's hard to decide who is the oldest, and you can get into the minutiae of it. We're just going to say 
It is very old. I personally don't consider it the oldest in the area, especially because the current structure that you see here is one when it was rebuilt. In 1898, this was place was rebuilt with, I think, 45 or 50,000 local bricks, some massive amount of bricks out there. What I do know is that it is in possession of the longest flowing spittoon. So if you look down at the bottom of the benches there, that is a free flowing water spittoon where you, you know, it's your spit cup essentially. And then it just washes it away so that you don't have to worry about just the weirdness. And it is an original part of the brick saloon there. Not just the spittoon in the saloon, but beneath, this is what I'm really interested in. There are jail cells. And the jail cells down here constantly have um, either an old cowboy or a young girl are the two entities that are seen down here the most often. And it's the same thing. They'll do tours of this place and little kids in particular will see someone sitting in these old jail cells that they now have underneath the bar down here. And they'll be like, what are they doing down there? And the people leading the tour are like, what are you talking about? We don't see anything down here. But they'll they'll keep saying that like, oh, there's a little girl. She's in the back of the jail cell down here. If you are finding yourself going across the Cascade Mountains, uh, particularly on I-90, it is worth stopping into Roslyn, Washington, not just because it is the filming location for Northern Exposure, a very popular show in its time, but um, just to see that free-flowing spittoon and to drink in a place that has a rich history, oldest or not, is really awesome. And if you have the opportunity to go down and see the jail cells for my paranormal investigators out there, do so because uh, especially at night, there is just an incredible collection of activity that goes on down there. And um, yeah, seeing the little girl is something that people I've been with have reported. Like you can feel the energy downstairs in there. So let's go now to one of the unsung heroes of haunted bars, Billy's Place, Billy's Restaurant in Aberdeen, Washington. Good old Aberdeen, such a, a rough reputation for a lot of people, but really a cool town with an incredible history. If you're not aware, Kurt Cobain is from Aberdeen, Washington, and it is is a sweet, sweet place here. And Billy's Place has one of the darkest and most haunting, I guess you could say, histories out there because it is attached to a guy named Billy Gold. And Billy Gold has a reputation for being Aberdeen's most successful and infamous serial killer and mass murderer who would uh, lure in sailors and lumberjack timber workers in the area, murder them brutally, and then dump their bodies in the river out here. And this became known in the area as the floater fleet because all these bodies were washing up on the shore out by Grays Harbor. And they estimate that upwards of 100 people between 1906 and 1909 were murdered in the area. But here's the thing about that. Um, Billy Gole ends up being put on trial, convicted of all of these murders, essentially. They, they try to hang all of them on him, but... Uh, it ends up being a guy named Charles Hatberg or Charles Hautberg, who had been found in the harbor kind of near Indian Creek. And he he gets hung uh, on Billy and they they put him away. They put him into a penitentiary and eventually he is convicted and executed for this. But the story of Billy goal goes beyond that, where when you look at the history of the area, uh, a local historian started to dig into it more and more because he was unsatisfied with the story about Billy Gole and looks at to the actual documentation about it and finds that what we know about him is that Billy was a very successful union leader. He was an intimidating, huge guy, and he was always on the side of the worker. And he 
organized and championed the unions in the area. And what set off our dear historian looking into the story of Billy Gold was that it was local business owners tied to the timber company who exclusively brought charges against Billy and then had him convicted. And looking into it further and further from there, the, it starts to unravel and the historic most accurate today understanding of Billy Gould's story is that, in fact, he was not a serial killer at all. He was a champion of the people who fought for union rights and that these local business owners put all these, these mysterious deaths on him and had him wrongfully convicted and then eventually he dies. And that he comes back now looking for a level of vengeance, for a level of justice. Because all of these bodies, these hundreds of bodies that are washing up on the shore out by Aberdeen are actually from unsafe labor conditions in the lumber camps in the early 1900s, late 1800s. And that this guy who ends up getting convicted for murdering all of them was actually the champion of people's rights at the time. Now, Billy's Place is still an operational saloon out there, and they have continuous sightings of a massive, well-built, angry man who shows up at the back of this place, who shows up in the restroom, who shows up in the mirrors, who is out there, and that people always feel like he is searching for something, seeking something. For me, the Billy Gold story is a beautiful example of how you might think you know something, but the more you dig into it, the deeper and in a lot of ways more horrifying the real truth is that business interests in the area could end up convicting a guy just trying to champion the rights of the people. And that now his ghost lingers in a local bar looking for some level of retribution and injustice to his own story, which for me is I think the perfect place for us to stop. There is a tremendous amount to uncover in the area. There are a lot of bars that are haunted and otherwise throughout the state of Washington, and I hope that we get to uncover more of them as we move through our journey together. I appreciate you guys joining me. If you enjoyed your tour tonight and you would like to show your appreciation, you can always tip your guide, that's me, right on the homepage of prettygrittytours.com. Again, that's prettygrittytours.com or you can use this handy QR code that we now put across the screen here, and that will allow you to do so effortlessly. Or, frankly, if you're feeling a little more altruistic, for the entire month of October, I am going to be working as an ambassador for the American Cancer Association's um, Real Men Wear Pink campaign. And so if you would like to send your tip tonight to help uh, raise awareness for breast cancer, and to help people get screenings and to fight against this horrific disease that claims not only women, but men's lives, please do so. You can use this QR code right here to make your donation to the Real Men Wear Pink campaign. Either way, I appreciate you guys being here. It is truly my pleasure to get to guide you guys around the state of Washington, hither and yon. Until next time, stay tuned. We have really remarkable content with a lot of exclusive stuff coming up next week. We're going to be taking a peek inside Fort Lewis or Joint Base Lewis McCord. And I got to be escorted around the facility by the wing historian. Uh, the wandering historian is his, his handle, but he's the wing historian for the air force down there. And the, the amount of stuff that we got to see down there is truly remarkable. And I'm excited to get to share that sneak peek of JBLM with you guys and tons of haunted content, tons of historic content, tons of great Washington content coming up for you guys. So until next time, my friends, keep on exploring. I'm excited to see you guys soon. Until next time, I'm your guide, Chris Dottinger. I'll see you guys soon.